All right, the, the last step in this flow is, um, you know, you've gotten to the point where your, um, your training and your validation error are like reasonably close to what you want them to be. And so then the last thing to do is to um, tune hyperparameters. Um, the challenging thing about hyperparameter optimization is that there's a ton of different hyperparameters that you could tune. So, you know, let's say that we've decided to use a ResNet. Um, well, actually, the, the choice of network is itself a hyperparameter. We can choose, you know, there are many other networks that we can choose. But even within a ResNet, how many layers should we use? What weight initialization scheme should we use? What kernel size for our, our convolutional um, kernels? And, you know, any other sort of parameter of the network. Um, for the optimizer, like, let's say we've decided to use Atom, but what batch size should we use? What learning rate should we use? And, you know, what Atom specific parameters like beta 1, beta 2, and epsilon should we use? Um, regularization, you know, et cetera. There's, there's so many different things that we could possibly decide to tune. How do we pick which one we should do? Um, a couple of things to keep in mind here. One is that um, most sort of models and data sets are more sensitive to some hyperparameters than others. Um, unfortunately, which ones it's sensitive to typically depend on the choice of model and the, and the data set that you're working on. Um, and so in reality, like the only way to do this really well is to sort of try a bunch of different hyperparameters and build some intuition about which ones um, are particularly sensitive to your problem. That being said, um, I, I do have some rules of thumb that I, I like to follow if, you know, if you're working on a new problem, which, which things should, should you try playing around with first. And a caveat here, a couple of caveats actually, First, like these are really only rules of thumb, and they might be very different for your problem. And second, um, the sensitivity that I'm going to talk about is relative to default values, right? So, um, for example, like if you're initializing your weights with all zeros, then you'll get a huge jump from moving to some other weight initialization scheme. Um, but you know, if you're already using sensible defaults, like we talked about, then uh, then your weight initialization might uh, might be a, like sort of a less sensitive metric. All right, so um, I think the ones, the hyperparameters that I think a lot of models tend to be very sensitive to are um, learning rate and learning rate schedule, um, right? So if, you, if you're using a cyclical learning rate or if you're decaying your learning rate over time. Um, the particular loss function that you choose, um, I think this is a very underrated thing to play around with. Um, you know, rather than tuning which specific model architecture you're using, instead playing around with your loss function and trying to change that. Um, the size of your layers, so whether you have, you know, 64 units or 256 units in your layer. Um, and to me, those are the things that sort of jump out as very frequently being um, large drivers of change in performance of your models. All right, so you know, we've chosen some hyperparameters to tune. Now, how do we actually go about doing that? The first method, and I think the one that most people start with, is just manual hyperparameter optimization. And so how this works is you, know, you build a really good understanding of the algorithm itself. You know, for example, you, um, you deeply understand that like, if you increase the learning rate, it means that, you're, that your training is going to be faster but less stable. And then you, you know, train and evaluate a model, or a few models, and you guess. Right? You, Say like, you guess what a better hyperparameter value would be than this based on your learning curve. Um, and so this can be combined with other methods, um, but, and it has a couple of advantages actually. One is that I think if you're, if you're a really skilled practitioner and you, um, and you really understand the algorithm, then this can be sort of the most like computation efficient, uh, computation efficient way of selecting really good hyperparameters. And this is kind of why um, you know, the concept of grad student descent exists in academia, right? It's like, if you're in a compute limited environment, then maybe the cheapest way to get the best model is just to pay a grad student basically nothing to tune your hyperparameters for you. <laughs> um, the main disadvantage, like, that's I think the, really the only advantage to this method. Um, it is worth like understanding how to do for some algorithms, I think, um, and I'll talk about why in a little bit, but um, the, Disadvantages are that you actually have to really understand the algorithm, which can be hard, and it's super time consuming, right? 
Um, so probably not the right thing to do. The second thing that you could do is do a grid search over your hyperparameters. And so the way that this works is you have um, a kind of a range of hyperparameters for uh, a range of each of the hyperparameters you want to tune. And then you just sample all of the grid points in that range and evaluate your model on all of those grid points. And the main advantage of this is it's super easy to implement this. And it can sometimes lead to good results. But it's not very efficient because you need to train on all of the cross combinations of hyperparameters. So if you're tuning more than two hyperparameters, then you're going to have many, um, you know, the dimensionality of the like, number of hyperparameters that you choose is going to make this problem very hard. And you also might need some prior knowledge about the hyperparameters to get good results, right? Like, should we be selecting learning rates between, um, you know, 1 and 10, or should we be selecting learning rates between, um, you know, 1, uh, like 10 to the negative 3 and 10 to the negative 4? The next method is random search. And so the way this works is, you know, again, you select ranges of, uh, for all of your hyperparameters. But instead of, sam instead of selecting grid points, you sample some number of points randomly um, from within that range. This is also really easy to implement and tends to produce better results than grid search. But one of the challenges, I think, is that it's not very interpretable. Um, right? You get like, some learning rate that's like, just some random number. And then it just like, feel, you know, it kind of feels messy. Um, and again, you also might need to know in advance what the ranges to sample hyperparameters are for this to work. So a way to make this better is to do coarse-defined random searches. Um, and so what you do here is you, know, you'll, you do a random search, and then you, you look at the performance of each of the points in that grid, and you select the best performing ones. You zoom in on that range and resample. Um, and you can do this over and over again. Um, and so the, the advantage of this is that you, know, you can start with a very wide range of hyperparameters and quickly narrow in on the high-performing ones. And um, I would say like, this tends to be the most used method, um, at least that I see among practitioners. The disadvantages are it's somewhat manual. Right? You have to decide, OK, which, of, like, which range am I going to zoom in on? Um, so you might ask, like, can we do this more automatically? And so um, you know, there's a bunch of techniques that I've put in the category of Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. Um, and so at a high level, the way that these techniques work is that you, you start with some prior estimate of the distribution of parameters. Um, and you maintain a probabilistic model of the relationship between you know, your choice of hyperparameter and the performance of the model. And you alternate between um, you know, training on the hyperparameter values that um, maximize how much you would expect your model to improve by selecting those hyperparameters and then using the results from those training runs to update our probabilistic model of the relationship between parameters and um, model performance. Um, and I, I don't want to go into the details about these methods, but um, I would recommend checking out this blog post if you're interested in learning more about how these work. And so you know, the advantage is that like, this tends to be the most hands-off way to select good hyperparameters. Um, but they can, these hyperparameter optimization methods can be notoriously difficult to implement from scratch. And um, there are a lot of good tools for them, but they can be difficult to, to integrate with. Um, and so Sergey's already talked about this a little bit. Um, but so my summary of like, what should you actually do here, I think where I would typically start is I would start by doing course-defined random searches. Um, relatively easy to use, tends to work really well. And then I would consider moving to Bayesian hyperparameter optimization as your code base matures. Um, so as, as you start having more and more people work on, on your, your projects, and as the code base itself starts to get to a point where you're relatively comfortable that things are working, um, that's, when, that's the point where I would consider trying to integrate with one of these um, off-the-shelf hyperparameter optimization solutions. OK, any questions? How to reduce special false positive detection? Say it again. How, how do you reduce special false positive detection? What does special false positive detection mean? I'm not sure. How to pick sensible ranges for hyperparameters? Yeah, this is, this is challenging, right? So I think um, the main thing is just prior knowledge. So if you are, um, you know, for example, like if you're trying to select a reasonable range for learning rate, then what you might do is you might go and look at 
um, some tutorials that use that learning rate or maybe the paper that introduced that learning rate and then look at the learning rates that they selected on tasks that um, are reasonably similar to ones that you care about. And um, that can be a good strategy. And then you can like expand around those ranges. But I think as you build experience with particular algorithms, you'll get a sense of like what reasonable learning rates are. Um, yeah, and then you can always just start wider than you think. Sometimes if I'm working on um, sort of a problem where I don't really have a good sense of what a good learning rate is, I'll just, I'll start by selecting like learning rates, for example, um, you know, uh, um, on a log scale. And so I'll, I'll select, you know, 10 to the negative one, 10 to the negative two, 10 to the negative three, all the way down to 10 to the negative six maybe. And then I'll run all of those, those runs. And usually like only one or two of them will work well. And then I'll just zoom in on that range and switch to this course defined random search technique. Do you recommend using differential learning rates? Uh, what is differential learning rates? I think that usually refers to different learning rates for different parts of your model. Oh, um, I think that's a, I think differential learning rates are a good, again, it's like a good thing to have in your toolbox. I would, I would, I think I rarely see that used in practice, um, except maybe when you're fine tuning. Um, so if you're, if you're using a pre-trained model in fine tuning, then I do see people use that relatively frequently. Um, but so it's something to be aware of, but it's not something I would, uh, it's something I would start considering as you exhaust other options. Yeah, fast.ai is big on this because they're always fine tuning. Yeah. Do you recommend using warm up for learning rate? Yeah, warm up for learning rate can make a huge difference. Um, I think it's particularly useful to use warm up for learning rate when you're using large batch sizes or when you're trying to like um, scale something up to a distributed Im implementation. So like a lot of the, you know, a lot of these like train ImageNet in 12 minutes type papers, um, the way that they do that, the way they do that is they take sort of um, your like standard ResNet or whatever that you're using on ImageNet, and then instead of having a batch size of you know 32 or something like that, they're going to scale this up to a thousand GPUs, and so they want to use a batch size of 32,000. Um, and so I like in principle, what that should allow you to do is to also increase your learning rate by a factor of a thousand. Um, but in practice, if you just increase your learning rate by a factor of a thousand, even if your batch size is a thousand times bigger. Your, um, your loss will explode. And so what they'll do is they'll start with a smaller learning rate and then they'll gradually increase it um, over time. And so I think there's a lot of cases where, incre like where warming up your learning rate makes a lot of sense. And it's a little bit problem dependent. I'm not sure I have a general rule for when you want to use it. What is your thought about using genetic algorithms for hyperparameter or architecture search? Seems like a reasonable thing to try, yeah. I don't have opinions on specific um, hyperparameter optimization methods. When doing batch training, the final error includes noise. Using, uh, using the error to select hyperparameters can be misleading. How do you deal with that? So is the question like your, your validation error is a noisy approximation of your error on the validation distribution? And so how do you deal with that? I think so. In practice, you just ignore it. Yeah. So it's more uh, unique algorithm design decision. It's more specific about full linear evolution. It was a paper back in 2017 with like really good results. But then suddenly, uh, like it's really quiet in this area. Hmm. So I wonder if you try to use something like that, use it like for approach to take, or there are some kind of difficulties with that because it's like very good result and so should just not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I'm not familiar with the specifics of that paper, so I can't really comment on it. Um, I do think that like, like population-based training, for example, is, uh, seems to be really popular right now, and, it has, and there are a lot of really strong results coming from those techniques, and you can see those as like sort of a variant of a genetic algorithm. Um, so yeah, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's gone away. I mean, I think in general, like machine learning tends to be a little bit um, uh, cyclical, like old ideas come back, so. And uh, how do you think about cross-validation? Is there a role for cross-validation? I think in deep learning, I would not use cross-validation. Yeah, it's a, it's a great technique to use if you're, um, if you're in a small data regime where, and you're training models that are fast to train. Um, but in you know, the deep learning world where we have tons of data, um, ideally, and, we, um, and it takes a long time to train our models, then generally people don't use it. 
All right.